Namaste. Something really far out happened last night and today. I was very concerned. I don't know why. <laughs> For some reason, I really wanted to know why does Brahman create the world? Why does non-duality create apparent duality, maya? And why does he create the world with all kinds of suffering and ignorance and, you know, all the problems? And I was really caught up in it. <laughs> I was really stressing out over it. Like, I haven't read anywhere in the scriptures, even though I've gone through all the major Puranas and the major Upanishads, and I'm uh, almost halfway through Vedanta Sutra, but I haven't run into any information on why Brahman creates the world. So then I got up this morning and started to study Vedanta Sutra, and what do you know, just a few pages after I took up my reading again, my study really, I came across this discussion. What is Brahman's motive in creating the world? Take a look. The opponent is arguing that Brahman is not the cause of the world because there's a need for some motive for creation. It's a huge deal. I mean, it's a tremendous effort, incalculable effort, to create the world and maintain it. I mean, why does Brahman do that? Right? And in the very next sutra, here it is. But creation for Brahman is a mere pastime like what is seen in the world. And in Shankaracharya's commentary, he brings up the example of a great king whose all material desires are satisfied. Of course, we don't see that these days because the leaders are such rascals. They're never satisfied. They're always greedy. That's a sign of a really low-class person. Someone who is intelligent does their duty, and is satisfied by that. That's discussed in all the scriptures, especially Bhagavad Gita. But anyway, he's saying, it's often seen that a great king, who is completely satisfied as far as his material desires, sometimes goes out and takes a ride, or hunts, or does some other pastime just for the heck of it, just for the enjoyment of it, just as play, as sport, with no real purpose attached to that activity. And the same is true of Brahman, that Brahman creates the world as a sport, as a play. He's not really attached. This leads to further questions, of course, like why does Brahman create the world over and over and over again in many different kalpas and so on and so forth? I'm sure that <laughs> Vedanta Sutra will get around to answering this also. But what it pointed out for me is that God is responsive. He is not dull. He is not indifferent, especially to the devotees. But he is in everyone's heart. And so he is watching everything, what everybody does, what they think, what they feel, and so on. So when I was in great anxiety trying to answer this question, why does God create the world? Just see what a perfect arrangement the very next day I come across the answer in the scriptures. Now, this is not the first time something like this has happened. <laughs> I'm sure many of you could share similar stories of just like opening up a scripture at random 
and coming upon the answer to a question, a deep question, an important question that has been seriously uh, bothering you, like it was me last night. And so then this brings up a further thought. Why do we get liberation, moksha? Isn't it because we desire it so completely that we are willing to let go of everything else? Isn't it that even after getting the knowledge, aham brahmasmi, I am Brahman, everything is Brahman, this whole world is actually Brahman. This is the knowledge that leads to liberation. In other words, this knowledge has no material result. You're not going to get rich or famous or beautiful <laughs> by believing it. But the proof is that those who do believe it attain liberation and they get complete freedom from suffering. So this is the proof that this knowledge is not an active knowledge, like an instruction or a prohibition or a fact. I'll give you an example. An instruction would be, you must perform sacrifice. You must pray. You must chant mantras. And a prohibition would be, one must not kill or harm any living creature. A fact would be a useful piece of information. The examples given in the scriptures. Your grandfather buried a chest of gold under the northeast corner of your house. That leads to action. In fact, all three of these kinds of instructions, injunctions, prohibitions, and facts, lead to action. One takes action based on them. But the knowledge, you are Brahman. This world is Brahman. Everything is Brahman. doesn't lead to any action. If we use the example of a chemical reaction, you have a, a base, some substance, some chemical, and you have a reagent, which is some active chemical, and then you can have a catalyst. And the nature of a catalyst is that it facilitates a reaction without being consumed in it. In other words, it's not directly involved in the reaction, but simply by its presence, it allows the reaction to take place. So in a similar way, the knowledge of Brahman is a catalyst, a catalytic agent that causes a certain reaction to take place in the mind. And when that reaction is complete, both the phenomenal world and the knowledge of Brahman disappear. That is the distinct symptom of knowledge of Brahman. That it doesn't cause any action, but it causes a certain reaction that leads to attainment of Brahman and then the cessation of all suffering, the cessation of the material creation. So this is something very special. And how does it come about? You know me, I like to take things apart and see how they work. <laughs> I've been doing that since I was a kid. <laughs> I used to always get in trouble for taking apart, you know, the radio, the record player. I tried to take the TV apart, but they stopped me. <laughs> which is a good thing because I probably would have got zapped. But anyway, I like to look under the hood and see how things work. So my insight from yesterday's and today's experience is that you must have a sincere and intense desire. Just like I had this intense desire, a really strong desire to where it was literally keeping me up at night. Now, why does Brahman create the world? What is his purpose? Does he have a goal? 
What's he trying to do anyway? And of course, the answer is well, he's beyond all that. See, we have a habit of projecting our human values and human motivations and so on on Brahman. Isn't it? So, I mean, even the scriptures take advantage of this. And they use metaphors to say, well, Brahman is the sun. Brahman is light. Brahman is prana. Brahman is the mind and so on. Brahman is the intelligence seated in the heart. Say like this. And then later on, they negate these superimpositions. And then what's left is pure Brahman. And this is how we realize by what's not there. Neti, neti. Not this, not this, not this. Whatever comes up, it's not this. What is it then? Well, it is what it is. And one realizes Brahman by an experience. The knowledge is only the catalyst. The experience is the reagent. And our desire is the active ingredient. There is a nice word in Bhagavad Gita that one should have vyavasatmika buddhi. Vyavasatmika means that one's dear desire of the heart is totally focused on God. Vyavasai atmika. See? That one is completely determined, completely desiring to realize God and nothing else. This is the ingredient, and Brahman, of course, is the chemical in the, in the analogy. And what is the catalyst? Knowledge in the scriptures. So it's very interesting that the scriptures' uh, scope of validity is only in the world of unenlightened people. People who are still covered by ignorance. People who are still maintaining upadis and covering Brahman with identifications and projections and desires. But there is one desire that leads out of this, and that is the desire for liberation. Mumukshatvam. Mumukshatvam is when the upadi, the only upadi left, is I must attain liberation. I must get free from suffering. I must realize Brahman and get out of this samsara forever. That is the key. That is what brings on the liberation, eternal liberation in Brahman. Aung Tatsat. Aung Shakti Aung. Aung Namah Shivaya.